After the disaster's actual gravity was understood, the world demanded details of the Titanic's sinking. But the official inquiries into her loss ended up quite lacking in what actually happened in the final moments of her life. For one reason or another, these two inquiries appeared to ignore dozens, if not hundreds, of individual eyewitnesses who saw the ship breaking in half, sometimes three or more pieces, instead concluding Titanic sank intact. Many other accounts, written in newspapers, personal letters, and diaries from the survivors, have been lost for decades. It is not until over 100 years later that historians have unearthed these lost records of the ship's destruction. They must be interpreted with a grain of salt, but are still quite illuminating. With acknowledgments to the many historians at the Titanic International Society, these testimonies were found and shared. With them, we can better piece together the final moments of Titanic, and if anything, it proves that there's still much to discover about her story. Now let's listen to a handful of some of Titanic's lost and unaccounted stories. We got away from the ship for a safe distance, for there was no doubt now about her sinking. The front portion of her was pointing downwards and she appeared to be breaking in halves. Then, with a mighty and tearing sob, as of some gigantic thing extinct with life, the front portion of her dived, for that is the only word I can use properly to describe it, dived into the sea, and the afterpart, with a heavy list, also disappeared, for as the vessel sank, millions and millions of sparks flew up and lit everything around. We rowed about 400 yards from the ship before we saw her settling slowly by the head. Then there was an explosion. The lights went out and the ship seemed to break, the nose plunging down and a stern bucking almost straight up. I put my hands over my ears to shut out the wailing as the lights went out. And those on board began to realise that something dreadful was going to happen. I don't believe that there was one passenger who had any idea the big ship was in danger of going under until 20 minutes before it plunged to the bottom. The last explosion occurred about that time, and then the passengers became excited and there was a great confusion. By that time the boat I was in had pulled away a considerable distance. I could hear music but I couldn't distinguish the tune. When the big ship passed and the hulk drifted apart before going under, we all sat still, shivering and afraid. It was the most wonderful, and at the same time, awful thing I ever saw. The half seemed to rise out of the water, gaining impetus for the great trip to the bottom, 2,000 fathoms deep. Then I saw the lights on the big ship go out, Soon after was the sound of two muffled explosions, and the officer told us it was the explosion of the boilers bursting. We watched the great boat, fascinated by the horror of the thing, then suddenly the stern of the ship rose in the air. There was a crash as the boat split, and then the plunge. She began to settle by the nose. Then, came two dull explosions. We saw her break in two. The bow which had been pointing downward dipped, turned up again, writhed and sank with the stern, exactly as one had stepped on a worm. A lifeboat, and evidently one of those that overturned under its load floated up to the rail, and we grabbed for it. We climbed upon it and drifted over the submerged part of the Titanic. We passed under the forward funnel and just as we were clear, it fell. I jumped out feet first. I was clear of the ship, went down and as I came up I was pushed away from the ship by some force. I came up facing the ship and one of the funnels seemed to be lifted off. 
fell toward me, about 15 yards away, with a, with a mass of sparks and steam coming out of it. I saw the ship in a sort of red glare, and it seemed to me that she broke in two just in front of the third funnel. At this time, I was sucked down, and as I came up, I was pushed out again and twisted around by a large wave coming up in the midst of a great deal of small wreckage. As I pushed it from around my head, my hand touched the cork fender of an overturned lifeboat. I looked up and saw some men on the top and asked them to give me a hand. One of them, who was a stoker, helped me up. When I got on this, I was facing the ship. The stern seemed to rise high in the air and stopped at an angle of about 60 degrees. It seemed to hold there for a time, and then, with a hissing sound, shot down right out of sight with, with people jumping from the stern. The stern either pivoted toward our boat, or, or we were sucked toward it, as we only had one oar we could not keep away. There did not seem to be very much suction, and most of us managed to stay on the bottom of the boat. We were less than half a mile from the Titanic sometime later, and watching eagerly when someone noticed that a big, round ball of light on the masthead was descending. We had heard a couple of explosions when we were near the boat, and then out there we heard the big one, which broke her in two. It was hard to see the forward half very distinctly because the lights had gone out of it. The back half was still brightly illuminated, however. Some of these steerage women thought the forward half, which appeared like a big black shadow, which was another boat we had run into. Then there were a lot more little explosions coming rapidly, one after another, and we could see the big ball of light descending. There were many rows of lights for the different decks, and they were slanted at quite an angle with the one splotch of light above. Then I saw all the lights were moving downward. Gradually, the lowest row of lights began to shorten from the lower end, and then it finally disappeared. Then the same thing happened to the next row, and then I heard a great cry. I could still see the big ball of light and the reflection on the mast. It was descending at the same steady pace, until finally it also went out of sight, and all became deathly still. Something in the very bowels of the Titanic exploded, and millions of sparks shot up to the sky, like rockets in a park on the night of a summer holiday. This red spurt was fan-shaped as it went up, but the sparks descended in every direction, in the shape of a fountain of fire. Two other explosions followed, dull and heavy, as if below the surface. The Titanic broke in two before my eyes. The forepart was already partly under the water. It wallowed over and disappeared instantly. The stone reared straight on end and stood poised on the ocean for many seconds. They seemed like minutes to me. It was only then that the electric lights on board went out. Before the darkness came, I saw hundreds of human bodies clinging to the wreck or leaping into the water. The Titanic was like a swarming beehive, but the bees were men, and they had broken their silence now. Cries more terrible than I had ever heard rang in my ears. I turned my face away, but looked round the next instant and saw the second half of the great boat slip below the surface as easily as a pebble in a pond. I shall always remember that last moment as the most hideous of the whole disaster.